This morning we are in week two of our series called Difficult People, where we're learning how to lead ourselves to deal with difficult people. Our theme for 2022 is lead, and it's not just leading others to Christ, but a lot of it is leading ourselves. Because we are all going to be faced with difficult people in our lives at school, at work, here at church, you know, in your neighborhood, wherever you go, even sometimes at the intersections, whatever. There's difficult people, but there's sometimes you have more interactions with people. And we're looking at these next four weeks, how do we deal with difficult people? Last week, we talked about the overly critical Next week, by the way, for those who have manipulative or controlling people in your life, we're going to be dealing with that. But this morning, we're talking about overly needy people. Okay, how do we deal with overly needy people? And, and the, as is the case with all difficult people, we want to react appropriately because how we respond to overly needy people can do two things it can either bring them to Christ or push them away for Christ. And secondly, it can either cause them to remain in their state of brokenness and dysfunction and unhealthiness, or it can put them on the path to wholeness and healing. And so we want to know how to deal with difficult people. So this morning, as we talk about the overly needy, I want to first say, as Christ followers, we need to realize that God has called us to help the needy, okay? God has called us to help the needy. All of us are to have a growing heart for the poor. We are to have a heart for the outcast, for the ones who are kind of on the outside, the fringe of society. We are to have a heart for those in need, and beyond a shadow of a doubt, we need to see our resources, our time, our treasure, everything we have is not being my resource, but as God's resource to be used at his disposal as he directs. So we want to help needy people. But as, and as we talk about the overly needy, we're not talking about that group of needy people, okay? We're talking about people that, as one gentleman who wrote a book, he called them emotional vampires. Because if you allow them, they will suck the life out of you. And there's four categories of emotional vampires. Okay, these are not in the Bible. These are just something that someone made up in your notes this morning. If you're taking notes, and by the way, they're on the back of your worship program, or you can go to YouVersion. Uh, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, go to the events page. Find Radius Church, and our sermon notes are right there. But the first emotional vampire is the incurably insecure. The incurably insecure. insecure. This is the person, you just saw them five minutes ago, okay? And they're coming up to you and saying, are we okay? Are we all right? You know, it's like they're very insecure in their relationship and, and you're concerned for them. They're the person that maybe you just spoke to them a, a half hour ago, and now they're calling you to see if everything's okay, and you didn't call them back, or maybe they just wanted to talk to you about something, and you didn't call them back immediately, or you didn't pick up the phone, and you call them back a couple hours later, and they say, did I do something to offend you? Are you mad at me? You know, why did it take you so long to call me? How, how many know someone who's incurably insecure. You know someone like that. Yeah, some of you do. Now here's the thing. When I say incurably insecure, that's just a title. That I don't believe anyone is incurable. I believe that everyone can be made whole in Christ. But here's the thing. So many times insecurity comes from we get our value and validation from what either other people think of us or the things that we accomplish in life both of those are external means of validation. And as long as you're trying to get your value from an external means, from other people or what you do, you will never be secure. Because your value comes from having a relationship with Christ and then knowing your identity in Christ. And so that identity in Christ is what makes us secure. And we need to be renewing our minds in that. But so many people who are insecure, don't 
take that effort because it is an effort. It is a self-discipline. And so they look incurably insecure because they won't take the steps they need themselves personally to find their identity in Jesus. That's the first category of an emotional vampire. The second one is the drama queen or the drama king. All right? These people, no matter how small something is, they blow it up and they make a big deal of it. You know, I call them chicken littles also, okay? Because, you know, an acorn hits them in the head and the sky is falling, the sky is falling. You know, they'll come to you and say, you can't believe what happened to me this week. It's the worst thing ever. You know, they, in fact, they spell ever with two V's. Ever. It's the worst thing ever, you know. And they just blow things out of proportion. And it's like, you know, it's a catastrophe. I'm going to die. I can't make it. Things are so bad. God hates me. All these things. And it's just drama, drama, drama. How many know a drama queen or a drama king? Yeah, a lot of hands. How many of you are a drama queen? Or No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Notice I didn't ask who's sitting next to one, all right? No. All right, let's look at the third level of emotional vampires and these are the blabbers blab 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 and these are the people that just can't stop talking and they will talk and talk and you know they'll share stories about they'll give you a rundown of their day and i mean almost every part of their day even maybe like i then i went to the bathroom and it's like no the tmi too much information you know or they're the people that they will communicate conversations they had with people that you don't even know. And it's like, you know, then Sally said this, and Meg said this, and I said this, and Meg said that, and then Sally said this, and then Sally got mad, and then Meg said this, and then I tried to pacify them and do this, and, that, and it's like, you know, and they're the people that even if they call you, they might leave that conversation on a voicemail, and it's a 47-minute long voicemail. I mean, how many ha have experienced that before? You know a blabber, okay? Yeah, some of you, you know those, all right. What's the fourth and final kind? The fourth and final kind is the financial leech. The financial leech. And these are people who aren't just in need, but they're habitually in need. And generally, it's because of poor decision-making in their own life. It's like that old cartoon character when I was growing up, Wimpy on Popeye. You might remember him. And he always came up to Popeye or to someone else and wanted to borrow money. And it's like, you know, can I borrow some money? I'll gladly repay you Tuesday so I can have a hamburger today. Yeah. They're always in need. And the situation is they always have a reason for why it happened. Oh, my car broke down. I had to take my dog to the vet. Or I'm not getting paid what I deserve. Or I should have a better job, but they just won't give me that promotion at work. And if I just had that promotion, then I'd have what I need. And there's always a reason for why they have financial issues. What's funny about financial leeches is that many times they drive more expensive cars than you and I do. They have, you know, all the gadgets. They have more streaming services than you and I do. They have more expensive phones than you and I do. And yet, they're so needy. And they just need us to bail them out and to help them. Those are four different types of emotional vampires. And we need to be careful because if we allow them, they will suck the life out of us and drain us. And... As Christ followers, we need to have hearts that are full of compassion and empathy for all needy people, including overly needy. But as we minister to needy people and overly needy, we want to be careful that we don't enable them to stay in their dysfunction and unhealthy state. And at the same time, we need to be careful that we don't allow them to guilt us into doing more than what we're capable of because it can deplete us and drain us 
and then be unhealthy for us and our spouse and our family and those around us. This is something that I've, I've realized about many emotional, um, uh, not em- just emotionally, but overly needy people, is that many times what you do for them is never enough. It's never enough. And when you begin to pull back because you're just feeling like it's drawing you too much into a black hole, they wig out, you don't care about me. You don't love me. If you loved me, you would help me. Oh, you call yourself a Christian? Well, then why don't you help me? That's not very Christian of you. Also, they're generally very ungrateful. You do something for them, and they very rarely will say thank you. They're appreciative. It's never enough. They always want more. And so this morning, we want to talk about how do we deal with overly needy people. And we're going to look for a minute in Matthew chapter 9. You can turn there if you want. We see how Jesus had this tension in his life. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says, When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. That word, moved with compassion, is a Greek word, and it's spalachnon, all right? Really fun word. It literally means your intestines or your bowels, so it symbolizes really kind of the deepest, innermost part of your being, and that compassion is flowing from this deep part of your being. It's not just a superficial surface compassion, but it's something that comes deep within, and it stands for, it means tender mercies, it means compassion, it means sympathy and inward affection. There is no other Greek word that expresses a depth of concern and compassion as this one. And so this is the word that describes Jesus. This is how Jesus feels about those who are weary and scattered. So in your notes this morning, Jesus cared more than anyone who has ever lived. Jesus cared more than anyone who's ever lived. And maybe some of you, you're here this morning or you're watching online and you are in a place of need today. I want you to know that Jesus cares more than anyone around you. Even though you maybe don't feel like it, Jesus cares more for you than anyone else. However, there is a tension because the next point there in your notes is that Jesus, while he cared, he did not heal everyone or grant every request. Jesus did not heal everyone or grant every request. We see this in John chapter 5, and it's the story of the pool of Bethsaida. I'm going to pick it up in verse 2. It says, In Jerusalem there is a pool with five porches called Bethsaida near the sheep gate. Now notice verse 3 here. Inside these porches lay how many sick people? Many sick people. Some were blind, some could not walk, some could not move their bodies. Verse 4, an angel of the Lord came at certain times and made the water move. All of them were waiting for it to move. Why? Because whoever got in the water first after it was moving was healed of whatever sickness he had. A man who was there had been sick for 38 years. Jesus saw him lying there and knew the man had been sick a long time. So this 38-year-old cripple, he has been, he's at the same place where all these other sick people are. How many realize that? He's not all by himself, but he's right at the pool with everyone else. Jesus said to him, would you like to be healed? The sick man says, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is moving. While I'm coming, another one gets in first. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your bed and walk. At once the man was healed and picked up his bed and walked. Jesus healed that man. But do you realize that Jesus then walked away from all the other sick people who were there? 
Let that sink in. Jesus is the most caring person, but he didn't heal everyone who was sick. He didn't grant every request. Why? I don't know. This is the thing, and as we talk about overly needy people, this is the thing that that I want you to pick up on. I can't, no one can give you a lock, stock, and barrel answer that applies to every situation that you're going to face with a person in need. You and I are going to have to rely upon the voice of God, upon the discernment of the Holy Spirit of when do we meet needs and then how far or how much of that need do we meet. It's going to take spending time in the presence of God and being people who walk in the Spirit that we sense when a need comes before us, we sense this is what God would tell us to do. All right? So, It's something that we're going to have to develop in our lives. And I can guarantee you probably won't get it right all the time. I know I don't get it right all the time. But we want to be listening to God and do what we can do. So this morning, I want to give you three keys to helping people without enabling people. Okay, Three keys to helping people without enabling people. Key number one, there in your notes, offer what they need, not what they want. Offer what they need, not what they want. When a person is in a state of being overly needy, what they may actually want may be the wrong thing. A great example is found in Acts chapter 3. After Jesus had died, the disciples, they're going into the temple, and there is a beggar there, and this beggar, that's how he made his living, by sitting at the gate of the temple, and he asked people for money. And it says he was carried to the gate every day. All right? So this is what I find interesting. If he has been carried there every day, then for the past three and a half years that Jesus did his ministry, that guy was carried to the gate of the temple. How many times did Jesus go into the temple to worship, to sacrifice, or to teach? Several occasions, right? And this guy, I'm sure he knew who Jesus was. I mean, word had gotten around. Especially, I mean, he threw out the money changers. And I'm sure he knew he was. And yet, in the whole three and a half years, not once does he look at the Savior and say, Jesus, would you heal me? Jesus, would you make me well? You see, I don't know why he did, but I I, kind of wonder... Did he just think, you know what, I have it so bad there is nothing no one can do for me. That's how overly needy people feel a lot. And and it's like, God can't help me, no one can help me, but they, they want help. And here's the thing, they're trapped in a victim mentality. And it's like, I need other people to support me, I need other people to help me, but... They're limiting themselves on what God wants to do in their lives. And there may be some of you here today, you're trapped in a victim mentality. That you feel like nobody can help, not even God. Friend, you will never achieve and become the person God wants you to be. You'll never have the destiny and the purpose and the abundant life that Jesus died to give you if you persist in a victim mentality mentality maybe this guy because realize this guy as people gave him money that means he doesn't have to work that means he's not really responsible for anything but if he is healed now i've got to go out and i got to get a job now i you know maybe it's digging ditches maybe it's cleaning out cisterns maybe it's working out in a fruit orchard i'm gonna have to work Maybe he was afraid. He now would have to take responsibility for his own life. But he never asked Jesus to heal him because he was more comfortable in his state of neediness than he desired to be set free and made whole. And maybe you're here and you're overly needy today. 
Do you want Jesus to set you free or have you become comfortable in your state of unhealthiness, in your state of neediness, and you want to be their friend? It's Satan wants to keep you down. Jesus wants to lift you up, save you to the uttermost. As we talked about earlier, he has so much in store for you, but your neediness may be keeping you from what God has in store. Okay, let's move on. We see here in Acts chapter 3, Jesus is dead. He's gone to heaven. He's interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. So now, Peter and James and John and the disciples, they're walking in, and today it's just Peter and John. And this beggar, he says, hey, do you have any money? He wants money. But is money his real need? No. Look at uh, Acts 3, verse 6. Peter says, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. Friends, instead of giving a handout, Peter gave a hand up. Peter lifted this guy from his state of neediness, from his victim mentality, and said, you are going to walk, you're going to be free. Through the power of God, Peter provided healing for this guy. And so when a person is overly needy, we need to ask God, what is the best thing for them? Not, God, what do they want, but God, you know what they need. Show me what this person needs so I can give them what they really need. At all stages of life, we will find ourselves being needy at one time or another. And this is something I've realized. When I am needy, when I'm hurting, when I'm going through a difficult time, I usually don't have the wisdom, the insight, or the perspective to know what I really need. None of us do. We think we know what we need, but we really don't know. So what do we do to help people that are in need. In your notes this morning, a couple of practical points. We need to identify the real need. Pray for discernment. Say, God, reveal to me the real need. Someone might be saying, I need you to spend more time with me. And maybe the real need is they need to develop other friendships so that they're not overly dependent upon you, that you are their sole source of friendship and companionship and encouragement. They may say, I want you to help me with my $500 a month car payment. When what they maybe really need is they need to get on a budget so that they can afford that. Or maybe they need to save for a $5,000 car instead of the $35,000 car with a $500 car payment. Be praying and say, God, show me what they need. When someone comes up to you and says, help me, and it just kind of hits you in the face, say, let me pray about it and I'll get back to you. Now, I can almost guarantee if it's an overly needy person, they're going to say, Pah, you're just putting me off. You really don't care about me. If you cared, you'd help me. And that's for you to say, no, I really want to ask God about this. Okay? They may say, I want you to make me feel special. You're the only one who can make me feel special. But what they need is to feel special from Jesus Christ, because only God can make us feel special. So the first thing is identify the real need, pray for discernment. Number two, the second bullet there, is pay attention to actions, not words. Pay attention to actions, not words. When we're trying to help someone who's overly needy, many times their actions and their words don't line up. For instance, they may say, I can't get a good job, but their actions are saying, you haven't looked for a job. How many have, have ever experienced that one? Yeah, they, they've never looked for a job. Someone says, no one will hire me, and yet you know there's three or four fast food restaurants or a few retail stores. They've got signs up, help wanted. Go look. Sometimes they say, I feel like that job is beneath me. And maybe what they need to do is they need to learn discipline. And they start out because making something is better than sitting at home making nothing. Sometimes they say, man, I just don't get it. Nobody wants to go out with me. I, I can't get a date. You know, if maybe on their last date, 
You were an hour and a half late because you were busy playing video games with your buds and you got caught up with it. And then you realize the time and so you threw on a wrinkled shirt and your hair is all disheveled and you haven't brushed your teeth and you show up to the date and you say, hey baby, here I am. <laughs> words going to get around, okay? Your words and your actions don't match. And so you need to look at what people are saying and what they're doing and maybe address the situation and say, hey, this doesn't match here. You need to change your actions because your perceived reality doesn't meet what you're doing. Okay? Okay, so that's the first thing that we need to do. Number one, to help overly needy people is that we need to offer what they need, not what they want. Number two this morning, the second thing to help people without enabling them is to set healthy boundaries. You have to set healthy boundaries. We see Jesus doing this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 35 to 37. It says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, the house where he and the disciples were staying, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. When they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you! Where have you been? You need to be out there healing people. You need to be out there meeting needs. And Jesus set boundaries Then he says, No, I need to get away with my father. Jesus set boundaries boundaries in his life he was in high demand from other people but get this even the son of god knew that he needed to draw away and spend time with his father if we don't set healthy boundaries we will become emotionally unhealthy and needy ourselves and then we can't help anyone and so we need to make sure that we are practicing Proper self-care, okay? Now, some people use that as an excuse to do nothing, all right? But we need to practice proper self-care so that we're healthy, that we have enough emotional reserves to minister to our families, our spouse, other people around us so that we can fulfill our responsibilities that we have. And we need to proper, uh, exercise proper self-care. A couple of boundaries that we need to set, one is time boundaries, when you're dealing with overly needy people, you need to set up specific time boundaries right up front. For example, maybe someone wants you to get together with them and you'd say, you know, I'd love to do that, but can we do it next Saturday because I have set aside Sunday as a family day. So set up boundaries where you've got time with God, time with family, time for your responsibilities, and then offer alternatives. There'll be sometimes they say, well, that's when I want to do it. You need to do it right then and there. If it doesn't fit in your boundaries, your priorities, then let it go. Offer alternatives to them when it doesn't fit into your boundaries. Another example is, absolutely I have time to talk with you about that right now, but I've got an appointment in 30 minutes. So we can either talk now for 30 minutes or we can set up an appointment where we can talk about it. All right? So you're putting limits or you are establishing your time. You are in control of your time. Instead of a need pops up and boom, you just give all you have and now you're late for your meeting, you're missing other commitments and that type of thing. You've got to be in charge of your time and set healthy boundaries. Another one is resource boundaries. That's the second kind of boundary to set is your resource boundaries. You need to set healthy resource boundaries and Tell people what they can expect right up front so they don't become dependent on you. That you might say, you know, yeah, you can crash at my place, but you can only stay here for a month. And after that, you need to find somewhere else, okay? And you let them know they've got a month. Or maybe you'd say, I'd love to help out. I can help with $100 a month for the next three months. However, and here's the thing, I... I will give you $100 this month, but you have to go to a financial counselor and set up a budget and look at your finances so how you can take care of this. And if you don't go to one by the end of 30 days, I'm not giving you the other $200 over the next two months. So you're giving them conditions, you're setting boundaries, how much you're going to help, but you're also helping them work on those areas in their life. 
If you don't set healthy boundaries, they will be an emotional vampire and suck the life out of you. The, fr- the, the truth is, you do care about them. And that's why you set boundaries. Because if you become drained and complete, uh, depleted, you're no good to anyone. You can't help anyone. All right, let's take a look at the third and final thing that we can do to help people without enabling them. Number three, we need to love them enough to allow them to face their consequences. We need to love them enough to allow them to face their consequences. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says, Don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. Now help me with this next part here, okay? A man will what? Always reap the kind of crop he sows. You will always reap the crop you sow. In other words, there are consequences for your behavior. How many have found that to be true? Yeah. And overly needy people need to experience those consequences. Verse 8, if he sows to please his own wrong desires, he'll be planting seeds of evil and he will surely reap a harvest of spiritual decay and death. But if he plants the good things of the Spirit, he will reap the everlasting life that the Holy Spirit gives him. God has established natural consequences for wrong behavior. And if you and I interrupt that order, then we interrupt the work that God is trying to accomplish in their lives. Look at this. God uses negative consequences to teach an earthly lesson in order to alter an eternal destiny. God uses negative consequences to teach an earthly lesson in order to alter an eternal destiny. A great example of this is found in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. It's actually a father who had two sons. One of the sons said, Dad, I want you to give me my portion of the estate. Take half of your wealth, cut it in half, give it to me now, and I want to go out and live how I want to live. Now this son knew, I can't live the way I want to live in my father's house. If I want to do that, I need to leave home. The father had a standard that the son was expected to keep, and he didn't lower his standard to accommodate his son and keep him from leaving home. So the son went out. He blew his father's wealth by parting hard. He had no food, and he finally realized, man, if I go back to my dad's house and I become a slave, I will have it better off than what I have it right now. And so he came back to his father's house. But his father, he didn't go out and rescue him. I'm sure that dad, as he was concerned for his son, wanted to go out and rescue him from the pig pen where he ended up at. He was taking care of pigs, trying to eat the food the pigs were eating. And yet the father let the son stay there until the son came to his own senses and realized I've made a mess of my life now I need to go back to my father and I need to repent of my sin we need to be careful that needy people we do not allow them to be bailed out and we keep them from experiencing the consequences of their negative behavior some of you right now you're facing the consequences of sinful decisions you've made. And you're struggling with it. And you want God to bail you out. And God is saying, you need to repent. You need to turn. As long as you stay in this situation, you're not going to find peace. You're not going to find joy. You're not going to find hope. You're not going to find me as being your provider because you're living outside of my plan for your life. If that's you this morning, I encourage you, turn back to God. It doesn't matter what you've done, how far you've sunk, even if you've gone down to the pig pen because you blew everything and you feel you've blown it, God saves you to the uttermost. And He'll raise you up and set you up in His house as a beloved son or daughter. So, we need to Make sure we're not bailing people out. A couple of practical points here. 
we need to realize that rescuing isn't always helping. Rescuing isn't always helping. Mom and dad, sometimes the most loving thing we can do is just step back and watch and let our sons and daughters experience the consequences of their behavior. That hurts. That's tough. There's some of you, maybe you've got a child who's not a minor, all right? And they're dating a wrong person. And you know this person is unhealthy. They're lazy, they're not doing any work, and they're making your child kind of do all the work and, and be the one in the relationship. You see these healthy patterns. Maybe they're being mean and cruel, taking advantage of them. And you share your advice and you say these are the warning signs, but you can't rescue them because if you rescue them, they're just going to return back and keep going back. Sometimes you have to get to the pit before you realize I need to get out. There once was a, a dad uh, and he went to see a counselor and he, he began to tell the counselor, he says, my son has a serious, serious drug problem. He's been arrested several times for drug abuse. Each time he does, I have to go down to the courts, have to pay bail, get him out. And the last time he was high, he wrecked his car. He did a lot of property damage, hitting other cars and destroying things. He says he stays up all hours of the night. He's parting. He comes in whenever he wants. He doesn't have a job. He lays around the house. He gets up whenever he wants. He, he plays video games. He mooches off us. It's just, you know, I'm just sick and tired of it. My son's got this horrible drug problem. What do I do? And the counselor looked at him and said, Sir, your son doesn't have a drug problem. You have a drug problem. And this dad got a little, mm. He said, I don't have a drug problem. My son's got a drug problem. No, and, the, and the counselor says, No, you have a drug problem. And the dad says, no, didn't you hear what I said? I'm going down, I'm bailing him out of jail, he wrecked his car, he's not working, he's lazy, he stays out at night, my son has a drug problem. And the counselor said, sir, your son doesn't have a drug problem. You have a drug problem, because all the problems that your son is receiving of the drugs is what you're experiencing. And until your son begins to experience a drug problem he doesn't have a drug problem you do and so we need to be very very careful and, and we want to pray because sometimes in these situations God may say rescue them but there's other times when God says don't go there don't do that just step back fold your hands Pray to me and trust me that I am going to work through this. Because sometimes that's the only way people learn is to get to the bottom themselves. Maybe you've got a roommate. They can't get their tail out of bed every day. You're their alarm system. You're waking them up. And you might have to say, you know what? I'm not waking you up anymore. You might lose your job, and maybe you're doing it because you're concerned that they're not going to have the money to pay for their room rent, and then it's on you. But you're the one who's pushing them. You're getting them out the door. You're doing everything, and maybe you just have to step back and say, you can't do it. You're going to be out on your own, and I'm getting a new roommate. Maybe you have a family member who's financially irresponsible, and they're charging everything They've got a credit, part, a credit card and they party. They're buying flat screen TVs. They're you know, spending tons of money going out partying, eating out, buying video games, buying whatever they want, living life. And you might have to say, you know what? Not anymore. You need a job. You and I need to make sure that we're not bailing people out because rescuing is not always helping. Maybe there's someone that you love deeply right now, but they're really hurting, they're really needy. And you need to begin to say, God, I'm going to trust you because this is the thing. So many times when you love someone, 
you want to save them and help them. But in your notes this morning, Jesus is the Savior, not you. Jesus is the Savior, not you. You need to do what you feel God is calling you to do. And what He doesn't call you to do anymore, don't feel guilty. If you think that you're the necessary ingredient for someone's salvation, for someone's deliverance, you've got it all wrong. Because when they get to the bottom, they're not going to say, Craig, Joe, save me. No, they're going to say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, deliver me. And so there's a time where you just have to put them in God's hands, step back and say, Jesus, you are the Savior not me, and I am placing them in your hands. Let's pray today. Father God, I pray that you will give us a heart that is moved with a deep compassion. God, help us to see people who are in need and to use your resources that you have entrusted to us to meet those needs. And God, at the end of the day, we entrust them, these people we love, to you. We ask that you would meet all their needs according to your riches in glory. God, use us. Give us wisdom to minister to those in need. 